Good morning and welcome to worship at Tremont United Methodist Church. We are glad that you have decided to join us today. I'd like to start with just a couple of announcements. If you would take some time to fill out that attendance pad, that helps us in our ministry to you. And today will be our last Sunday online uh, of online only worship. On February the 7th, we will return uh, to a hybrid format. Online worship will be at 10 a.m. or 6 p.m. and in-person worship will be at 8.30 and 11. For in-person services, we will observe, uh, we'll continue to observe our social distancing and wearing of our masks. Due to relaxing mitigations in our region, also we are able to begin hosting small groups and Bible studies in the church building. To schedule your group, uh, you just need to call Jan at the front office to uh, get your group scheduled. And with that said, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we welcome you to this service and we ask your blessing of your presence. Bless what we give you, Lord. Take, shape it, and mold it, Lord, so it is pleasing unto you. We'll give you all the thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us affirm our faith together. The words are on your screen. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
the opportunity now to go to the Lord in prayer. And before we do that, we should take just a moment of silent prayer to focus and to get our hearts and our minds uh, centered upon the living God we know as Jesus Christ. So let us take um, just a couple moments of silent prayer. Oh God, we greet you this morning, and we are grateful that you have joined us right where we are. That may be in a living room, around a kitchen table, or wherever we are gathered. We sent your presence with us. We stand in awe, Lord, of who you are. So full of grace, so full of love toward your children, so majestic, yet so relational. We love you, Lord, and we are so grateful that we have this opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. Today, God, we are mindful of those who are are on a prayer list, many various different needs of our sisters and brothers, desperate enough to ask us to pray for them. We think, Lord, of those who are grieving, and we pray, Lord, for those who are facing medical situations, perhaps tests or surgeries. We think, Lord, of those who are facing some kind of um, financial situation, whatever that may be. Lord, we think of the of the division in our country. We think of the brokenness around us. There is so much need. We lift each and every prayer request up to you, Lord, as well as those that are unspoken. And we know, God, that you are already at work within each and every situation. Sometimes, God, we... We can't see that work because of our doubt and our fear. And so as we come to you this morning, I would ask for a fresh sense of your presence in our lives. Allow yourself to be known. Reveal yourself to us. And Lord, also as we, as we open up, Lord, a little more with our, with our mitigations and we can be a, a little more um, open, Help us, God, to realize that you are calling us to care for for each other. May that be a a porch visit or a phone call or a card or whatever, Lord, we're comfortable with. Help us to be intentional about that. Help us to be your hands and feet. You continue to call us, Lord. You continue to call us to fulfill your mission. Within doing that, Lord, we rest upon upon your consistent um, holding us and guiding us, your consistent strength and perseverance. We can't do this by ourselves. We're mindful, God, of how you continue to bless us. So many things that, that you continue to do, Lord, and we need to seek your face to continue to be intentional about finding you in our situations, to draw close to you, lean into you, seek you in your word. Reveal yourself to us, Lord. Hold us when we need to be held. Walk beside us when we need that and carry us, God, when we can't take another step.
We rely on you, God, and we rely on your Holy Spirit to give us strength. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture passage is taken from Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. Now, when Jesus had finished instructing the 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and proclaim his message in their cities. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to them, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. Pray with me. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Grant, O God, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts would indeed find acceptance in your sight, God, who is our strength and our Redeemer. For it's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Doubt. It's a feeling of uncertainty or a lack of conviction. And there are many times in life and situations in life where we might experience doubt. We can doubt our family, we can doubt our friends, we can doubt our government or doubt the media or even doubt ourselves. One of the hardest things, though, is for a Christian to have doubts about God, about their faith. And it's hard because Christians sometimes don't know what to do with feelings of spiritual tension or deep doubt, deep questions. So for the next few weeks, we're going to be in this series called Help My Unbelief. And we're gonna talk about doubt. And in doing so, we're gonna be asking some questions uh, like, is spiritual doubt the same as not believing in God? Or will God stop listening to my prayers if I have doubts? Or can I take my questions and doubts to God? And of course, in good preacher fashion, I'm gonna explain this all, all anyway. We're gonna, we're gonna spend a few weeks on this, but let me give you the answer up front. Having doubts, Having questions does not make you an atheist. It does not make you a bad Christian. If you have doubts, God still hears your prayers and absolutely wants to hear your questions and doubts. In fact, let me contend up front that I think it's in our moments of, of doubt and struggle and questioning that God may actually be drawing us even closer to himself. So if you have doubts or you have questions, listen up. Drop the guilt and use it. Use your doubts, use your questions to, to fuel you into a deeper journey of your faith. Doubt can be a bond as powerful and sustaining as certainty. When you're lost, when you're full of doubt, you're not alone. One of my favorite movies came out in 2008. It's an adaptation of a stage play, and it's called Doubt. It stars Meryl Streep, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Amy Adams, and it's based at a Catholic school in 1964. Meryl Streep plays the uh, very strict and devout principal of the school, Sister Aloysius. And Sister Aloysius begins to suspect that Father Flynn may have acted inappropriately with one of the boys at the school. She has no proof, no hard evidence, but she is a woman of certainty. In one scene, Sister Aloysius has pushed so hard and she's made so many accusations that Father Flynn reaches his breaking point 
And he resigns as pastor of the church and school and asks for a transfer to another parish. And in the final straw of that scene, she claims to have called a nun at one of his former parishes who confirms for her that he was indeed a bad priest. And Sister Aloysius tells Father Flynn that she's willing to continue calling members of his former parishes until she gets everything she needs to take him down. And even though he strongly denies any wrongdoing at all, it's obvious that, that such a narrative floating around about him and those kind of phone calls would ruin him. So he resigns and gets transferred to a new parish. And in the final scene of the movie, Sister Aloysius is now sitting outside with Sister James and she admits to Sister James that she lied about calling a nun in his former parish. She had done no such thing. And now, she feels far from God. Doubt has begun to creep in. Doubts about Father Flynn and what she has done. And doubts about God. Have a look. His resignation was his confession. He was what I thought he was. And he's gone. I can't believe you lied. In the pursuit of wrongdoing, one steps away from God. Of course, there is a price. I have doubts. <laughs> I have s such doubts. <laughs> I just love the drama of that whole movie and that ending scene is such a gut-wrenching scene. The woman who was so certain of everything now clings to the cross in her hands as she admits her doubt. And that's the part that, that sticks out to me the most about that scene and what I want you to notice is that even in her doubt, even in her struggle, she's still clinging to the cross. And in the scripture that was read for us this morning, even John the Baptist was having doubt. John, the cousin of Jesus, who, who prepared the way for the Messiah. This is the one who, who protested even baptizing Jesus, saying that Jesus should baptize him instead. This is the one who said of the Messiah that he would be unworthy to even untie the Messiah's shoes. This is the one who saw the heavens opened at Jesus' baptism and heard a voice say, This is my son whom I love, and him I am well pleased. This is the one who looked up at Jesus and proclaimed to his followers, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. A man who was so full of certainty about who his cousin was, Israel's Messiah, that man is now experiencing doubt. You see, things have, have changed for John. He's been arrested and he's sitting in the jail of Herod Antipas. Doubts start to creep in. This isn't the way this was all supposed to go down. How did I end up here? So he sends one of his followers to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? 
Again, I thought things were going to go a certain way. I was so sure that you were the one, that you were going to bring order, but now I'm starting to wonder. Author John Bloom describes John's doubtful struggle this way. Stuck alone in this putrid cell, he was assaulted by horrible accusing thoughts. What if he had been wrong? There had been so many false prophets in Israel. What made him so sure that he wasn't one? What if he had led thousands astray? The thought of being executed for the sake of righteousness and justice he could bear, but he could not bear the thought that he might have been wrong about Jesus. His one task was to prepare the way of the Lord. If he had gotten that wrong, his ministry, his life was in vain. Have you ever had one of those type of doubt-filled moments in your life? What if I got that one really wrong? What if I, I did all of that for nothing? What about doubts about your faith? What if God isn't real? What really happens when we die? Is Jesus really the way? What if, what if, what if? John the Baptist is having those kinds of what ifs. What if I got this all wrong? What if I'm gonna die for a lie? What if I perpetuated this lie? Jesus sends word back to his cousin and answers his doubts. Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. And, and it's just such a beautiful response because of what Jesus didn't say to John in his moment of doubt. He didn't say, well, that's it, cuz, you're out. You just wait until you're not invited to Thanksgiving. I can't believe you doubt me. No, Jesus answers him with the truth of what was happening. He offered reassurance to the doubts that John was having. Cousin, I know that things aren't playing out the way that you thought they would, but let me assure you that I am the one that you think I am. And here's the evidence of that. The blind are receiving their sight, the lame are walking, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. Who else could I be? He reassures his doubt. And in life, I think that we really experience three different types of doubt, intellectual, emotional, and moral doubt. Intellectual doubt is when our minds are unsure that the teachings of Christianity are true. We question God's existence, or we struggle to reconcile our faith with science, or, or we struggle to, to, uh, to accept the scriptures as true or authoritative. Or we experience emotional doubt. This is usually associated with pain. It's, it's the age-old question of suffering. If God is good, then why do bad things happen to good people? Why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to my loved one? When we flip on the news and we see all of the division that exists in our world and we see Christians on the leading edge of, of, of every extreme, we have to wonder, is this really what God intended? Then there's moral doubt. And this usually means we're tempted to doubt God or our faith or the scriptures because there's something that we wish wasn't true. You ever been there? I want to do something, but, but it, it conflicts with what I read about God's will in the scriptures. Maybe there's a loophole to it, or maybe it's not true at all. Or we, we've done something, or we've done something wrong, and we don't want God to be right. That's moral doubt. I don't want it to be true. But I want you to know this morning, friends, that if you have or are currently struggling with any of these doubts, intellectual, emotional, or moral, you are not alone. Christians have wrestled with these doubts for centuries. We can seek evidence, we can try to find answers, but at the end of the day, our doubts are what take us on a journey of deeper faith and continual spiritual formation. And we're going to talk about that in the, in, in the coming weeks. I'm not going to preach the entire sermon series in one day. You can say amen right there in your living room. 
But what I really want you to hear today is this. If you have doubt, don't beat yourself up about it. Because I used to do that. I'd wrestle with something about our faith, or, and, and I'd start to have doubts, and then I'd feel like a failure as a Christian, a failure as a pastor. I've had doubt-filled, dark nights of the soul where all of the what-if questions roll in. And perhaps after the year we've just had, there were more of those doubt-filled struggles. And the way that this year has begun, perhaps there's more on the way. If someone as sure and passionate as John the Baptist can have a moment of doubt, then we're in good company. God knows that we have questions. God knows when we struggle with doubt. And that's why he repeatedly tells us over and over again in Scripture, do not fear. God also tells us to pursue the development of our faith, to grow. And if you've gotten to the point where you are certain about everything, that you've got it all figured out, then your faith is probably dead. Questions, doubts, those are great motivators to fuel us in the pursuit of growing in our faith. And time and time and time again, in those moments that all I can do is cling to the cross and confess my doubt, Lord, help my unbelief. In those moments that all I can do is cling to the cross and confess my doubt, God has continually come through to show me how good, how loving, how powerful, how trustworthy he is. He's opened my eyes of doubt more times than I can count, so many times to remind me who he is and what he's up to in this world. Dark and devastated and divided as this world is, God is still up to something. And in those moments where I'm full of doubt and struggle and question, he reminds me to open my eyes and look and see that there are still places that the blind receive their sight. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them. We all have doubt-filled seasons. But if we cling to Jesus and seek his answers, he will open our eyes time and time again with glimpses of who he is and the good that he is up to in our lives, in the church, and even in our world. Pray with me. Lord, I don't know what doubts my friends who are listening to this morning are struggling with. I don't know what all of their struggles or questions are. But Lord, I pray that you would keep them from feeling guilt over those. That you would help them to offer those questions and doubts to you. That they would seek to grow deeper in their relationship with you by exploring those things that they struggle with. And Lord, there are places where we all doubt, where we all struggle, where we all have questions, that we struggle and wrestle with our faith. And we cry out with Scripture, Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Help us to cling to you so that you might open our eyes, Lord Jesus, to see who you are, to trust you more, and to see what you are up to in this world, bringing about your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. It's in your name, Lord Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Let's sing together, Open My Eyes.
glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God, thy will to see. Open my Friends, I pray that God would open your eyes time and time again to his goodness, his power, his trustworthiness, that you might have rekindled in you an awe of our God, and that as you wrestle with your own doubts and questions, as you cry out, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, that you would be driven again to worship at the feet of of our great God, and to learn and take on the likeness of his son Jesus and receive the empowerment that comes from the Holy Spirit. Don't give in to the what ifs, but use them to grow deeper in your faith. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. We'll see you next week at 10 o'clock or in person at 8.30 or 11. God bless. Have a great week.